Good food? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jen Stojkovic. I'm the executive director of SF City. We are San Francisco's tech advocacy organization, and we work to connect tech community to the greater San Francisco community. Uh, part of my work, other than advocacy, is bringing together really cool groups of people like yourselves to have really interesting conversations. We have a really, um, really fascinating conversation for tonight that I think is quite timely, um, given this last week and a half. This is my Pelosi pink, by the way, everybody. I, I pulled this out of my closet and went, no way, you know? Um, so as of today, I believe the count is we elected a 123 women. Uh, we, uh, we've got a long way to go. Um, but I, I hope that conversations like tonight um, are part of that, and I'm excited to be hosting. Uh, so I have a few quick remarks and thank yous, and then I will turn it over to Erin um, from Okta. So first and foremost, thank you, Okta. This is an amazing space. Um, thank you to Jess Ladd of Callisto, who will be speaking, as well as Peter Urias of Airbnb. Um, thank you to the Phenomenal Women Action Campaign uh, who also partnered with us on this event. Uh, you may know them as the folks that were behind the Thousand Men later. Did everybody get catch that in the New York Times about a month and a half ago? So uh, they're another really great organization. I encourage you to learn more. We've got Deb and Goatlandia in the back. Everybody likes to eat. Um, Deb is a friend of mine and, uh, you know, she does some really wonderful work among many things. One of the things that Goatlandia is doing right now is, uh, making themselves available for the rescues of the fire that's going on right now. Um, so many of those animals from last year with the Napa fires, they took in over a hundred, uh, and they're preparing this year to take in more as we start to kind of, uh, look at the devastation of what's happening up north. So I encourage you to learn a little bit more about what they're trying to do. Um, and lastly, I wanted to thank everybody that is here tonight and everybody that helped spread the word um, to ensure that we had a nice full crowd. With that being said, Erin, please come aboard. This is Erin, who's the executive director of Okta for Good, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more. Thank you, Jen. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Okta. I'm Erin. I lead Okta for Good, Okta's social impact and philanthropy initiative. Super happy to have you all here. This is the first time we're hosting an SF City uh, One City Forum event, and we are new members of the One City Forum. And the reason why we're so excited about this group is that it brings together conversations like this. Um, it was formed, what, a couple years ago? Two and a half years ago? And, you know, the One City Forum was formed at a time two and a half years ago where there wasn't a lot of conversation happening between tech and the broader community. And that's a big reason why this group came together. So we are five or so tech uh, social impact leaders who meet regularly with five or so nonprofit leaders in the city. And we talk about things that are going on and we talk about uh, what topics we believe are most important to bring to the broader community. And that's really what uh, what got us here tonight. And so um, we're excited to, you know, not just have a conversation and sort of learn and listen along with all of you, but I think tonight's particularly special because we're talking about a pretty heavy topic that I think has been in a lot of our minds, but we're going to hear uh, about some solutions and uh, some very powerful solutions that, that involve technology, sort of bridging that gap with community. So we're excited about that. And um, I just want to also say on a personal note that, um, you know, this topic, the, the, the title of tonight's event is Rebalancing Power. And I think that before you rebalance power, you have to examine power. And it's something I've been doing quite a lot just in my personal life lately and, and, and looking at power dynamics and, you know, individual relationships in organizations, um, in sort of the broader community. And I think that uh, all of us are probably doing a little bit of that examination. And so I'm excited to kind of take a step back and examine power dynamics with all of you tonight and learn quite a bit, I know, from our, our guests and um, kind of move forward together. So with that, 
thank you again for coming. I will turn it back over to Jen. Yeah, thank you. So we have a pretty interesting um, run of show for tonight. Um, so obviously we're gonna have a bit of a fireside chat uh, with Peter and Jess, but before that, Jess is gonna do um, a really neat overview of what Callisto is. Who here's heard of Callisto? Okay, there's a good handful in here. Uh, well, you guys are all gonna know all about this incredibly powerful tool um, as soon as the night is over. So Jess, I will turn it over to you. Hi all, I'm Jess and I'm the founder and CEO of Callisto. Callisto is a nonprofit that creates technology to combat sexual assault and professional sexual coercion. As you might know, there's something called the Me Too movement that's been happening. Uh, and while Me Too has been dealing with a lot of different issues, the ones that have really risen to national attention have tended to be either stories of sexual assault or stories of professional sexual coercion meaning somebody making sexual overtures or advances towards you who has power or influence over your professional or academic future. Um, and so we at Callisto focus on these types of sexual overtures or behaviors that either are not consensual or it's hard for them to be consensual given the power dynamics. It's estimated that one in three women, one in six men and one in two transgender individuals will be sexually assaulted or coerced at some point in their lives. Under a third of women ever report this officially. Rates of reporting are much, much lower among men who are sexually assaulted or coerced, and likely lower as well among transgender individuals who face this. Now, there are a lot of reasons why people don't report. One of them is a fear of not being believed, of not knowing where to go to report, of what will happen if you come forward, if you'll be believed. Another reason is not knowing how to label the experience yourself. Often it takes people a long time to feel comfortable labeling what happened to them, a sexual assault, coercion, or harassment. And then there's the fear of retaliation, that if you do come forward, will people hurt you? Will the friends of your assailant or your perpetrator try to harm you in some ways or retaliate you? Will this hurt your career? So there are a lot of barriers to coming forward. There's one main reason though why people do come forward and that is to protect others. People are afraid that what happened to them might have happened before or might happen again. And this is a very rational fear because 90 to 95% of sexual assaults are committed by repeat perpetrators. And the same is likely true of professional sexual coercion or more severe sexual harassment that a small number of people are causing the vast majority of the harm and they do it again and again and again and to get away with it again and again and again. Now there's some hope involved in that, which is that if we could identify and stop these serial perpetrators, if we could stop people even after their second sexual assault, we could prevent the majority of sexual assaults from ever happening. And the same is likely true of severe sexual harassment, that if we were able to identify and stop serial perpetrators, if we were able to give survivors the information they need of whether or not to come forward, whether or not they're the only ones, we could prevent the majority of harm that happens in our communities. So we at Callisto are focused on just that. This week, actually in two days, we are launching a new version of Callisto that is focused on finding serial offenders of professional sexual coercion or sexual assault. And here's how it works. Victim number one can come into Callisto, to our online information escrow, it's called, and they can store what happened to them in a time-stamped way. We ask them what the name was of their perpetrator and a series of unique identifiers like cell phone number or Facebook URL, Twitter handle, email address, et cetera, and they hit submit. Victim number two does the same thing. If they end up naming the same perpetrator, meaning they're putting in the same unique identifiers, they match and they are each connected with a separate legal options counselor. This legal options counselor is an attorney paid for by Callisto that counsels them on their options under attorney-client privilege. Now, the benefit of this is that this options counselor can let you know the whole range of your options. So what does it look like to go to HR? 
What does it look like to go, let's say it's a VC, to the partners of that VC? What does it look like to go to the police? What does it look like to go to the press? What does it look like to go public on Twitter? What are the pros and cons of these different approaches so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to come forward, and if so, in what way? One of these options is to somehow share information with or correspond with the other victim. So if what you want to do depends on what happened to them or depends on what they want to do, there's separate options counselors can share information back and forth without revealing who you are to one another and help you decide if you want to take the same step at the same time. This means that if both individuals say go to HR at the same time, that gives the HR investigator a lot more information to go on, right? That there's more than one allegation. It means that both of those people are more likely to be believed, and it helps you feel less alone when, if you decide to come forward. Ultimately, what we want to create is one website for any victim of sexual assault or professional sexual coercion that can detect any serial sexual predator in the country. Uh, and we're doing this step by step. So in two days, we are actually launching to the startup community, to founders, to report sexual misconduct they faced really by anyone, but particularly by investors. And we did this in part because in February, we conducted a survey of Y Combinator female founders and found that 22% of them had been sexually coerced or assaulted by an investor. And that was with a 70% response rate. So this was not a particularly biased sample. But when that happens to them, there's often nowhere for their, them to go. There's not an HR department and most VC firms, even if there were, you wouldn't really trust it. So having a third party system that can really aggregate information and allow you to connect with an attorney rather than say HR department can create a way to create community accountability and protection, even in environments where there's really no entity that has clear jurisdiction. This is particularly important if we think about even within the tech industry, of offenders moving place to place to place um, and getting shuffled around. So how do we start to aggregate information that can protect the community holistically and doesn't just live within a single HR department? As we grow, we plan to grow from sector to sector. We're really starting with the tech industry this next year, but we're looking in at other industries as well. As you might imagine, the Me Too movement has caused a lot of people to reach out and express interest. And that's because this isn't our first go with this. So we actually launched a system three and a half years ago for college campuses focused on sexual assault uh, that has grown ever since. It is now on 13 universities, including Stanford, serving 159,000 students. And what we've learned is that survivors that visit their school's Callisto website are six times more likely to report. They report three times faster, and we've found serial offenders. So 15% of survivors who've entered into our matching escrow have matched with another victim of the same perpetrator, meaning that they were able to go forward at the same time and know that they weren't the only one. Uh, so I'll now pass it back to our panel, but I just wanted to give you all an overview of what the hell Callisto is and why I'm here talking to you today. Thank you. On? Okay, now I am. So I realized that we did a little bit of an unorthodox format here. Uh, so we didn't actually get a chance to do like a quick bio of, of who we are and, and what we do. So let's just quickly, Jess, if you want to kind of introduce yourself and how you came to this and then Peter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I grew up in San Francisco on Castro Street during the HIV AIDS epidemic. So sexual health and rights were always a very big part of my life. Um, I think when you grow up in the city and you see the young men in the city dying everywhere around you, you really start to realize that when we don't deal with these issues, when we don't talk about them, when we don't address them head on, uh, people get hurt. So uh, I have worked in the field of sexual health and well-being since the age of 16 as a sex educator, then as a policy advocate, then as an infectious disease epidemiologist focusing on sexually transmitted infections. As part of that, I became really interested in the power of networks and how understanding how um, understanding how linked behaviors are really important and that the power of networks can really be used to try to combat uh, population level diseases or behaviors in a pretty unique way. And I founded Callisto six years ago because I was sexually assaulted in college and I went through the reporting process. 
and I found it more traumatic than the original assault. So trying to figure out how do we take this process and really make it something that empowers somebody rather than traumatizes them all over again. Uh, Peter Ruiz, I'm an employment counsel at Airbnb. I lead our employment team. Um, and this is one of our, obviously our top priorities. Um, I guess personally, I would just say I've had a, a bit of history uh, um, involved in this issue in, in college. Um, I actually witnessed a sexual assault and then uh, developed a little um, sexual assault awareness prevention program. And every fraternity in sorority UCLA had to go through our training. Then I worked at Larkin Street Youth Services actually in San Francisco and saw some of the same things you were saying. A lot of sex workers, teenagers being exploited. Um, worked at um, different immigration organizations and helped folks get UV's applications based on sexual assault. And then I started my employment career doing uh, plaintiff side work at a small civil rights firm, um, doing harassment and discrimination cases. So this is something that's like um, obviously very important and you know, it's an honor to be here next to Jess. Uh, we have a ton of respect for her and what, what she's doing, and I will hope to learn and see how we can be better. Great. So quick um, note, let's just speak a little bit louder for the Facebook Live. Um, also, hi, Facebook Live. If anybody is uh, watching right now, please uh, submit any questions as the live stream goes through. We'll have time for a little bit of Q&A at the end. Um, so let's get right into it. I think uh, the most, the easiest way to start this would be Peter. Um, tell us a little bit more about why you are here on the stage tonight. Mm, I, well, so one, we're trying to learn from what Jess and Callisto are doing. I think, um, just taking a step back, I think the idea of reporting in the employment context is critical. It's very difficult to create a safe environment where folks feel like they can come forward they will come forward uh, and they won't be retaliated against. So um, one of the things we're doing at Airbnb is this Integrity Belongs Here campaign. It's a comprehensive effort to make sure that in every aspect of the culture um, and the structure and who reports to whom and having an uh, unbiased investigation body, making sure there's accountability, that we can increasingly show everyone at work that if you come forward, you'll be protected, we'll take action, um, and we'll do things in the right way. And it's, it's actually a very difficult challenge to get folks to be that vulnerable, especially in a networked, relationship-based work environment that everyone can relate to if it's your boss who determines everything. Um, and so one of the things we've really been trying to think about is how to, think, how to go outside the box and learn more about ways to report. So one of the things that Jess mentioned that I thought was really interesting was um, when, when the survivor reports, they may not want to go to HR, they might not, or in campus, they might not have wanted to go to the Title IX coordinator because that begins a process that's unstoppable. It's out of their control. And for us, employers, employees are in the same position. We have a legal obligation. If someone comes to us, we need to begin the process right away. So often we'll see employees where something happened to them, they don't report for a million legitimate reasons, and then months go by, and then when they feel like they can report, it's going back to witnesses who don't remember or are no longer here. And, there's no records and it's, it's harder to go through the process at that point. So the idea of having this escrow of reporting and being in control of the process is something we're really trying to learn about and, and support. So. so what do you, you said that you're trying to be transparent. What is this, the system that you have currently? What does that look like? One of the things we're trying to do is have multiple channels for reporting. So we have obviously your manager, your talent partner, we have an employee relations team. We also have um, an anonymous reporting function so it is anonymous, and it will, once it comes to us, we will look into it. Um, and that's obviously super important, and folks can choose whether or not to reveal their identity. Um, and that's, it's kept confidential, but it's still somewhat insufficient for people who are not sure they want to launch the process right away. Um, okay. And just one other note, I would say it's interesting. Globally, not everyone treats anonymous complaints the same. There are a lot of uh, countries where you can't actually legally um, succeed in holding someone accountable if your complaint is anonymous. And so one of the things we're trying to do is, despite the variation in local jurisdictions, is making sure that no matter how you complained or when you complained, that we'll still hold folks accountable and still take action on the complaint. Okay. So just out of curiosity, um, so you're looking at America for your database right now. How, how have you guys seen it differ from country to country, either of you? 
So we're pretty focused on the U.S., but we do on a weekly basis get inbound interest from other countries. Um, so it's always a bit of a challenge to stay focused, which I think is true for a lot of startups. Uh, but I think even within the U.S., it's there's so many different cultures. There's so many different. There's so much complex complexity, like legally and culturally, to the way that people talk about it and address this issue. Um, state by state, the definition changes, your op legal options for recourse changes. So there's so much complexity even within this country that we feel like we have a lot to do just here before we expand. Um, so we're pretty, pretty focused on the U.S. for at least the next several years. Mm -hmm. I'm just generally, aside from Airbnb, I can say that I think I agree. There's a tons of variation in culture and uh, in law. And even it's interesting, even if you have a local talent partner go to their local outside council and say, look, this is we're in the Me Too area. We need to be take this seriously. We need to take action. There's not that same level of urgency necessarily around the world. And lawyers, HR, I feel like there's still um, kind of a vestigial um, tendencies to not, to have a goal of if a complaint comes in, how do you resolve it uh, quickly and expediently instead of um, holding folks accountable? So. Yeah, one thing we want to be really careful of is um, different places use very different language and different ages and different industries, like the way that survivors describe their experience. There's a lot of diversity. And so we just want to make sure that we're building something that actually works, right? Like we're a nonprofit in part because we really care about solving the problem and making sure that our economic incentives are always focused on that. And so um, that means that we might go a little more slowly and a little bit more carefully, but we really want to be doing our homework when we get into any new community about how do we build something that will actually be effective that survivors in that community feel like they can trust and like we can really serve them well. And I imagine with language barriers as well, you're dealing with employees and how many offices do you guys have? Um, I think we have like 25 offices. Yeah, with a number of different languages. So not only are we trying to figure out shared language between states, but also literal languages as well. Interesting. So um, I know the two of you, you know, you have a really rich career in public health before this. Um, and Peter also had a career before this in uh, at Tesla. Right, so you guys, are, those are pretty different industries from from tech. Um, how have you seen kind of different industries react differently? Are they even talking to one another? It's been interesting for us since we've been focused on college campuses for the last last few years to sort of watch the arc of this issue, both sexual assault, particularly on college campuses, and now see sexual assault and sexual harassment happening in industries. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of transfer of information. So there are a lot of things that were tried, like how to do a climate survey really well. How do you measure this issue in a smart way that is ideally standardized across institutions within an industry? That college campuses tried to create, they created a standardized survey called the ARC-3 survey. It took them several years to create one, but then it started using being used across the industry. So could it uh, our industry, could the tech industry have a similar standardized survey and what might that look like? Um, or things that have been tried but didn't really work on college campuses now are being suggested within professional industries. For example, there's something called the Clary Act that requires schools to make public the number of reported sexual assault or harassment of crimes that happen uh, that's then published. Um, the difficulty then is it has created a incentive for schools to decrease reporting, not really decrease the problem, but decrease reporting. So I think we need to be really careful of when we want to tr create transparency or when we want to really actually measure how good institutions are doing at this, that the number of um, the amount of sexual misconduct that is reported actually might be a sign that a company is doing a good job. And we therefore need to be careful when we're thinking about what metrics to use to be measuring the right thing and not creating a perverse incentive. And I would just add to that, I think in, um, in terms of industries, and this is not like super smart thing to say, but obviously it varies, uh, varies by location. Um, I think here in the Bay doing tech, we have an incredible privilege, uh, the employees are super educated, they're super empowered relative to so many other industries, um, super vocal. And generally, I think in the Bay, tech companies are sensitive to that and are taking notice and are listening and are, are engaging 
um, like you've seen recent news. So um, I, I don't know that um, like public or near public tech companies, there's a huge difference. I think there is a huge difference outside of the Bay, depending on the industry, depending on the size of the company. I don't think that um, having multiple channels of reporting, having anonymous reporting, having an independent investigator, or having the same level of commitment to holding folks accountable, I don't think that that's universal um, in the US. And it's, it is, um, and I think you referenced this earlier, for folks who don't have that infrastructure, that is a huge, huge problem. A lot of times HR will report to the business leader of the office and will report to them about someone that business leader depends on, is it still working? Uh, depends on for their revenue and for their goals. And so there's a huge conflict of interest there. Um, and that's a structural problem. Even if people have the right intent, you create this conflict of interest that makes it very hard to have a right, um, have the right environment. All right, so I think there's a little bit of an elephant in the room with, with this next question. Um, there was a 17,000 person walkout you know, a week ago. Um, and there's, you know, it's, it's no secret that, that there's been a lot of kind of turmoil over um, in Google, one of the larger tech companies regarding how they're handling misconduct. I believe it was um, today that they announced that they'll no longer, no longer be using the forced arbitration agreements. Um, but I'm really curious, you know, for, for those of us in here that aren't really familiar with what, a, you know, these arbitration agreements entail, like, what does that mean? How does that differ from a court? Like, how does that differ in terms of reporting? Looks like um, your bread and butter okay, here. Okay, sure. So okay. Um, I think that, uh, so I guess I'll say a few things. Um, and we can talk about what, what we've done as well. Um, arbitration generally uh, is designed, and in California it's required to be relatively similar to a court, the same remedies, the same due process. You should decide things on the merits. Um, that being said, I think it's uh, become viewed more as, a, as an attempt to uh, stifle folks' rights or their ability to express what happened. Some arbitration uh, pr proceedings can have confidentiality provisions, which can uh, make the folks who are bringing the claim feel like they can't express what they're doing out outside of the proceeding. Um, so obviously, everyone is, is focused on that. Uh, laws are changing around arbitration provisions. Google recently changed theirs. Uh, to, I think, allow um, sexual harassment to proceed without going to arbitration. We've uh, also uh, allowing, uh, we're not requiring arbitration in the cases of sexual harassment, discrimination, sexual assault, or retaliation based on any of those claims. We, we think it's important, um, but I will say, I don't think that the legal remedies are really um, the driver of a good workplace and a, and a kind of a culture where folks feel like they can come forward. In my view, obviously you have to have your legal access. It's like a prerequisite. Maybe it's like a, a, a necessary condition. But when it gets to that place, so many things likely have already gone wrong. You've likely reported it. It's either you have action hasn't been taken or you've been retaliated against and you're in this place where you need to now uh, go forward and, and file a lawsuit to get what you should have gotten in the first place. So I think it has to be Whatever changes you make to your arbitration agreement has to be part of a broader effort that's comprehensive. You must have seen some of these arbitration clauses in your day. Yeah, well, one thing I've been thinking about is sort of what's the implication of this and similar measures in the long run. And um, when I think about what needs to actually shift to get companies to focus on the right thing, which is preventing this from happening rather than preventing it from coming out that it happens, uh, we really need to be paying attention to what are those things like forced arbitration agreements that maybe enable that or skew incentives. So I think that allowing uh, survivors and employees to have more options to figure out how to come forward, not be forced into one, any one option, does potentially start to shift incentives in a way that will get employers to focus on actually investing in preventing and responding appropriately to these issues versus covering them up. Um, I think the other thing to think about, though, is that a lot of our legal system is focused on employers being responsible for holding perpetrators accountable and the law responsible for holding employers accountable. But that doesn't always work. And as we think about us being in workplaces where people are moving around all the time or more and more people are freelancers or more and more people are in contract gigs, does like 
the role of HR as the sole person who can do that, does that actually still make sense in our modern day? Like, as it becomes less and less likely that uh, by the time a survivor wants to report that they and their perpetrator are both employed at the same place at the same time, it starts to become a little tricky. And I think when we've been speaking with survivors, they're often in this place where they no longer work at the same place they did when they were sexually assaulted or coerced or harassed, or they don't happen to be in the same employer in the case of, say, um, founders who are sexually coerced by investors. So I think we need to start to think more broadly about like, yes, how do we help HR do, do a better job? How do we help people come to HR, et cetera? But also, are there other approaches that we can use that might be a little more disruptive that says, let's just not only rely on HR to have the power to do this, because a lot of the reason why people are coming public with Me Too is because they don't feel like that's an option. Sometimes they went to HR and it didn't work, but often, more often, there doesn't really feel like there's an HR department they can even go to. I know, Peter, you, you know, we talked a little bit about this the other day. Um, there's a lot that we see of when these things kind of go awry and you hear about these reports coming out, what is being done through kind of prevention that maybe those of us in the room aren't aware, you know, employers are working on right now, if anything. Yeah, um, I think a lot. Um, one of the things we, like that we're, you mentioned folks moving around from place to place. And I think this is, I don't know that there is an answer to this. I think maybe, maybe first I should say, I think folks are trying to, we talk to experts all the time. I don't know that there are a set of clear best practices yet. And I feel like there's a lot to learn. And I feel like we're definitely continuing to learn every day. Um, folks do move around and it's not always clear. You don't always know why someone left another company. Typically that's under a severance agreement with confidentiality. And it's hard to understand in any context why someone left. So, um, you know, there's a series of things that we do that I don't know that they're perfect. I think they're we're trying to get to a better place. It's an interviewing process. Um, we try to have uh, competency-based hiring. We try to do values-based interviewing. Um, we obviously do a background check, do <laughs> formal references. We try to do informal references. Um, we try to do, especially as folk, for senior folks, a very vetted approach for people going place to place. That being said, it's very difficult to catch something like the, like a past uh, behavior. We also do, and I don't know if this is exactly um, the same type of prevention you're talking about, but one of the things we do is try to do company-wide surveys uh, twice a year. We drill into a whole sort set of questions. Uh, what's your relationship with your manager? Do you feel like you're respected? Do you feel like you can voice criticism? Do you feel like you're engaged? And we can identify hotspots and we can identify, we do like a really detailed dive through our data science team on where things might be happening that are not yet reported. Um, and then I think the, uh, the last thing is just, again, I know it's like a broken record, but doing everything we can to ensure folks know all the different channels to report and uh, constantly having messaging on what our options are, what our values are, what the policies are um, to make sure it's top of mind for folks. So I think, uh, you know, you just said data scientists, right? Um, so I, I don't think most of us in here have a data scientist on call. Um, how, how many folks in here work for a small or medium-sized organization? Under 50 people? Under 20 people? Okay, probably not a data scientist on, on payroll. What can we do? I think you still try surveys, but like, is it an anonymous survey if you have less than 20 people? So um, I think that a lot of the, similarly, like, can you report to HR in a safe way? If it's under 20 people, do you even have an HR you department? Have Probably HR, exactly. Not. Um, so I think figuring out what are other approaches. So one of the things that's important for us, say if we had a survivor come to our legal options counselor at a small company, would be helping them figure out is reporting to the board an option? And what does that look like? Um, some of the reason why we're starting in the startup ecosystem with sort of founders and VCs is this hope that CEOs of small companies will want to get something like in Callisto in there for their employees from day one to try to set the tone from day one that you are in a company culture that will take action uh, if this happens here. And uh, that we can be in conversation with VCs who often sit on boards of companies about how do you protect your investment from day one by also setting the tone uh, in a company that this is a place where uh, 
sexual misconduct is not tolerated. And that in that case, because you're put in touch with an attorney rather than a non-existent HR department, they can really help you navigate your options while keeping you anonymous um, and help investigate what does that look like to go to the board versus is there somebody within your company that you can go forward to with a complaint? Any thoughts? I, I, Big I Tesla that, over here. <laughs> I think that sums it up. I don't, I don't know, like, I, I, to be totally honest, I don't know the best option for someone who's in that context where there's no HR person and everyone knows each other and you need to make a report and you're taking a risk and you need to understand your company's culture and whether you'll be protected or not. Um, so um, I just second what Jess said. I don't have a bet better options. So I know um, Dr. Callahan, you're in this room, um, and I know that, the <laughs> look at you. <laughs> The, you know, one of the reasons I bring that up is we spoke with Supervisor Ronan um, and, you know, the city of San Francisco is also trying to increase their transparency um, for these types of cases. Do we see a role for for government here? You know, like we've got um, on a state level, we have changing the amount of representation of females on boards. I imagine that there being more representation of females on boards will make it a little easier to go to them. Um, is there local? policies that can be put in place that would affect San Francisco companies? So I think that there already is a lot of um, legislation focused on this issue. I think it's probably helping. I think New York probably set this, this the tone for this wave of uh, changing folks' arbitration agreements. Um, there is more and more legislation in California. There was a whole slew of sexual harassment uh, kind of improve provisions and protections that just got passed. So certainly I think that legislation does make a difference and does set the incentives. Um, yes, I, I, I guess the reason I'm pausing is because, again, I don't, I don't know that at the end of the day, the legal consequences are really what drives the up the stream changes. Um, and it, probably they will as, as consequences continue to mount. Um, but um, I think it's maybe, only part of the solution. So you listed a, one really good policy with New York. Is there any really bad stuff that we've seen? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I think there's a lot of really well-intentioned policies. Like I, I mentioned earlier, the wanting everybody to publicly disclose their number of reports that they've gotten is very well-intentioned, but often backfires. Um, similarly, mandated reporting and thinking about, uh, say, within the college context, if you go to your RA, they're required to go up the chain. That really makes it hard for a survivor to find people who they can talk to who feel like a safe resource for them. Um, so I think being really careful to always center survivor and survivor agency within any given policy and, and getting feedback from the people who you're impacting the most on whether or not it's a good idea um, is, I think, a good blanket rule. Um, outside of that, I think just really trying to figure out how hard this is to do. So for example, one policy change that's happening on the federal level right now with Title IX and college campuses is that uh, the accused are being given pretty much an unlimited right to appeal, meaning that they can bring it up again and again and again and again, which means that you as a survivor have to go through a basically trial again and again and again, um, which make it very unlikely that anybody's gonna wanna come forward. So uh, being really thoughtful about like, yes, respecting the rights of the accused, but um, thinking about how the appeals process could potentially be used as a tool of further harassment um, of a victim um, rather than a tool of empowerment for justice. And I would just add on to that. Um, I think that's a really great point. Like it's, if, if the process for asserting your rights is more traumatizing or, or just, is, just is traumatizing, it discourages reporting, it discourages asserting your rights. And um, it's part of the why, the part of the reason why I think that uh, at the end of the day, if you haven't, if you're putting someone in the position where they have to go to litigation, then the, there's been a big failure already. One of the things you, uh, I thought about for, um, improved policies, there's, I think the investigation process is so key. I think having an impartial investigation that goes through all the right steps and talks to the right people and has like a, a meaty resolution, um, is really important. And I think the EEOC has uh, put out a lot of guidance on investigations. That's, that is an area that I think, um, probably 
could use more support, especially outside of California, um, to ensure that when people do report, there's like a standardized, uniform, safeguarded structure that they can expect. They know they know what to expect. They know that at very least there's a norms for how to conduct this kind of process. The shared language again. Yeah. Um, a couple other ideas. I think one is funding for legal services for survivors. It's actually, it's really hard to get unbiased legal advice. Um, if you Google like sexual harassment lawyer, you can find an attorney, but often they're a litigator and often they're going to kind of pressure you to sue the person with the biggest paycheck rather than really be focused on empowering you to make the decision that's right for you. So figuring out could legal aid play a role in this? How would they get the funding for that? Um, and more research in this area, as well as just SFPD, that this is more if it's a criminal case, but SFPD does, does not have a great reputation on these issues. So figuring out how to get better training for cops on how to be empathetic um, to survivors and to help the, support them throughout the process. And just, to, I think the, your options counselors is such an amazing idea because so often folks come to a place even if they are lawyers themselves and they're like, what do I do? There's so many options. You have like free options, you have plaintiff side lawyers, you have the police, and it's pretty overwhelming and confusing. So I think it's an, it's an amazing kind of safe space to be able to find advice. Yeah, and that's been big as we're thinking about our training program for our legal options counselors. Often you are trained and you specialize in a particular part of law. So being able to really think through creatively, like maybe the survivor wants to go to small claims court. What would that be like? Like, do they have grounds for a criminal investigation or not? What happens in terms of a defamation claim or a suit if they go public? You're not necessarily equipped with the well-rounded education to know how to advise a survivor on the full scope of their options. So that's when been, been a big piece as we've been thinking about this program is how to build up the training for these legal options counselors as well as the networking among different types of attorneys so that they can advise one another and sort of knowledge share even if it's not their specialty. Um, similarly, often it's hard to figure out what state has jurisdiction. So if you pass the bar in one state, but it seems like another state has jurisdiction, um, how do you make sure that you can advise your client well? So is there any sort of training that you would recommend to, you know, some of the folks in this room that want to make sure that they're being, you know, the best allies they can be? What exists out there? Does anything exist out there? Is Callisto making something perhaps? <laughs> Uh, Calista is working on it, although we, we are mostly focused on trying to figure out how to really empower survivors to, to come forward and get the range of their options. We are, though, creating a survivor's guide right now, and we're about to do an end of year fundraising campaign for an allies guide to sort of how to be a better ally and what are best practices in that um, for friends, for family members, for lovers, for parents, for coworkers. Um, how can you really be there to support the people around you? Which often has to do a lot with just listening and not forcing them to do anything that they don't want to do and really figuring out how to empower them to make the decision that's right for them. I know that um, in my time at United Way, you know, we, we did a lot of education programs and health programs. Uh, and one of our programs was learning or teaching students how to not end up in domestic violent uh, relationships. And we found a lot of students were starting very early with some of those indicators, like 14 or 15 years old. Do you see education, um, the school system playing some sort of role here? It could, it should. Um, I think that consent education should be a standard part of the curriculum and figuring out, you know, early on, you probably don't talk about sex within that. You maybe talk about it in a bullying context and you talk about it in respecting the bodies of other people the and, power dynamics. and the power dynamics yeah. and how it's hard to stand up against a bully. But if they're bullying you, they're probably bullying other people. And mm -hmm. the other day I went back to, I went to San Francisco day school um, here and they had me come back as an alum and talk to a whole bunch of kindergartners about what I do. And they're like, just don't say anything about sex or gender. And I'm like, oh, no, no S word. <laughs> yeah. So I talked about bullying, but it's, it's, it's really strong parallel. So so trying to figure out how can we, from a really early age, help people think about respect, think about power, um, think about protecting others, and what does it mean to stand up to bully on somebody else's behalf as well as your own? Any thoughts? Mm. Like a dare style campaign, perhaps? <laughs> Love it. I mean, my my 
kids experience that all the time. So I think it's uh, it's brilliant. I think it's important. I think it's necessary. I don't know the best way to achieve it. Um, so perhaps um, an ed education program for other employers. Yeah, I mean, for, for education and training in, in the employment context, for sure, necessary. We have, obviously, like, um, it's required in California to have harassment pre prevention training. I think it's tough because everyone has, like, their basic harassment prevention training. It usually says the same thing. It has the same uh, text. It has the same questions. Um, so finding a way to, like, make that real and make it alive and make people actually care and understand. Um, and I think also this is, like, one of the, problems we have globally because the laws are so different it's very difficult to find a compelling global harassment training program and have like um because they're often so legally driven so you know trying to find a way to do like changing changing the culture and creating cultural norms uh, no matter where you live no matter what the law is what's okay and what's not okay yeah and i think another piece of that is that a lot of the standard programs they're they're like online you click through them you take a quiz at the end but you probably don't like you don't even have to have like a driving anything. test it's very compliance yeah. based it's often not about like what is ethical behavior it's not based on real examples it's not based on social norming and i think to do this well you have to like take time and money to do it like you have to have in-person conversations and small group conversations that are like real examples that it will actually be happening to your employees and that takes some investment to actually do that right um, but it's worth it, but it, it's like awkward and uncomfortable, particularly if people aren't used to doing it before. And it doesn't scale super well. And I think, right, we in tech, we want something to scale, but it's honestly, when you're setting cultural norms, I, I wish I could build some website that would help with that. But I, I actually think that a lot of that has to happen in person. And it's like boring things like an alcohol policy. So, I mean, talk, we were talking about industries before. I think there are certain industries like sales, for example, where uh, the culture is you have you all go out and you drink a lot and you have fun and who knows what happened that night and that's like a recipe for disaster so um, having things like that like where you from the top down everyone says this is our policy this is how we treat each other this is what we do and we're out of work we will lead by example we will actually not like in, enact very boring mundane behavioral ethical things to send the right message I think it was a certain athletic company last week just uh you know the the memo that was just asked if anybody saw um where they are no longer reimbursing strip clubs yes <laughs> under armor yes no but i don't think we have an under armor person in here but it's just like preposterous that in 2018 the ceo has to let you know like by the way guys like we're not going to do any more business meetings at strip clubs and it makes you you know it makes you wonder like, how far do we have to come in this? Um, and, you know, traditionally it's been HR is, is you know, where you're supposed to go. Um, I think uh, another piece that, that we talked about was ERGs. Um, is everybody familiar with employee resource groups? Does anybody not know what an employee resource group is? Okay. So, uh, and you are employment counsel, so correct me if, if there's a, a better explanation, but they're essentially um, groups of employees that are brought together um, under some sort of executive support um, to further, you know, the cause of some some type of, I guess, what would it, what would be the best way to... I'd say historically it'd be folks who, like who come from... Causes and diversity usually. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Folks yeah. who come from kind of underrepresented or marginalized groups, to be able to have a group that you know you have affinity with, you can kind of raise issues, you can suggest interventions, you can report things. Um, I think that's also another part of this. It, um, you talked about power dynamics, and different folks have feel different senses of power and entitlement in the workplace. And so, beyond just typical, you know, sexual harassment alone, the idea of diversity and inclusion I think is super central to this as well. So. Um, at, both as a norm and in reality in terms of your investment. So ERGs, I think, are, can play a big role in that. Um, yes, I think you're, we talked about the, the problem. Sometimes yeah. folks have a, have a problem with ERGs where um, they're designed to raise a group concern and to suggest something to management and to say, hey, look, this is, we see this thing, we want this change, we want more investment, we want more uh, different policy. However, uh, sometimes individuals who raise issues within the context of their of their peers don't always feel like those issues are addressed in the right way, and and it's a complex balance. Um, often, when you do raise issues among your peers, 
you don't necessarily have the benefit of confidentiality. Sometimes it's reported, sometimes it's not. Sometimes yeah. you say, well, I raised it and nothing ever happened. So it's, it's, um, it can add a lot of complexity. And I think it's important for folks to understand, especially when, when uh, they're starting ERGs, to know like if you have a real issue um, and you raise it, A, anyone in the group should be reporting it, should say, hey, look, this person, did something really happen to this person? And we need to know we need to fix it. And B, folks should understand um, where the right reporting lines are. And that's, the, I think, on the, on the obligation of the company to educate. One thing that I think about with this issue and that I hear a lot is sort of, oh, like just having more women in leadership will solve this or like creating women only spaces will solve this. And while like I think one should have spaces for women or minority groups or whatever groups to really be with their peers, that's important, or one should have diversity in leadership. I don't think that that's necessarily going to just solve sexual assault or harassment. Um, in part because it's not only women who are victimized and it's not only men who perpetrate. Uh, and also women aren't necessarily always great allies. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're actually far more dismissive than men are yeah. um, because they feel like they can be. And so um, I think it's in, important to have diversity of things. Like it's important to have inclusion. I think it's so essential for a million reasons, but I think that uh, that in and of itself is not going to address sexual violence. Yeah. So... I believe we're at the point where we can go towards some audience questions. Um, I know some of you, oh good, we've got, okay, so we've got the speaker at the back. Uh, we also have a couple audience questions that were submitted. Before we get to those, I do wanna do my quick lightning round that they are not prepared for. Very quickly, best burrito in San Francisco? <laughs> Just go. El Farlito, mostly because Growing up there, we would play Scrabble there great at, like late at night as teenagers, and so it has a very special Oh, place you're a Scrabbler life. too? I have a Scrabble tattoo. It's like, it's a big oh, part of my life. I did Scrabble Christmas gifts one year where I spell everybody's name, but then you run out of letters, so I bought like four different like Scrabble like editions. It was quite absurd. <laughs> That's awesome. Peter? I like Gordos. <laughs> I'm going to go Gracias Madre, if any veg folks are in the room. Okay, I see a couple nods. Um, favorite female icon and why? Beyonce, because she's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, outside that, uh, the great um, RBG. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter? Uh, I don't know if, it's, if I can say this, but I'd, I'd probably say Jennifer Lopez. I, she she just had this article that came out. I thought it was so cool. She was like talking about how she was going from being like the talent to being an owner of everything that she does and a producer. I'd say it's kind of already yes in that same, in that category sure. too. Both yeah. Of them. yeah. But she had this quote it was like like I'm in the groundbreaking business. I'm in the glass breaking business. If you don't understand that, I can't work with you. It's like so sick. So yeah, yeah. She'd probably be my my icon. Yeah, that's claim to fame. Uh, I'm going to, well, if I'll go non-fictional, um, Die Fi. If anybody hasn't read uh, Diane Feinstein's story, it is quite a story, and I really recommend you guys looking up um, her story. Okay, and then last one, favorite movie that takes place in San Francisco? Inside Out. Damn, you were, like, ready for that. Yeah. I think you stumped me. Um, I don't know. Uh, Come on, the room. <laughs> I used to live right near where they filmed it, and I thought of it every day when I walked by. I need to watch more movies. I think it's the lesson from today, for sure. Maybe like saving the world. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Stories are boring. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let me just pull. I've got one or two audience questions here that everybody submitted. Thank you for submitting questions. We got a lot of really interesting questions, by the way. And then we have time for a couple to go around the room and then food and drinks. What can we be doing in our workplaces to eliminate the taboo around sexism, harassment, and assault? Talk about it, um, particularly if leadership talks about it. I think it's really important that the C-level talk about it. Uh, including sharing stories. So I, I think in, in our workplace, I share my stories a lot. I think figuring out how you can create a, a place for people where you're not 
normalizing that this happens, but you are creating the ability for people to feel like you won't be somehow judged or thought of as less or broken or less powerful or something like that if you come forward. And really, um, survivors are the strongest people I know. And creating that norm, helping people understand that um, talking about things that are hard, including but not limited to sexual assault and harassment, um, and creating a space for resiliency and to talk about like the hard things in life actually creates, I think, a lot of closeness in a workplace and the ability to communicate about hard things in general, uh, which I think is really important for just being productive as well as just being a great place to work. Agree. Um, I think, and this is like a more narrow answer, but I, I think um, also in, in the worst context, ensuring that people aren't punished for raising those things or for, for bringing them up. And um, there, I think the sense that like retaliation can be so subtle, especially in the, in this world, in this like tech company world, I think. And so the idea of really making sure that you have deep insight into what happens to someone from the moment they say something through the progression of their career and their performance review and their, up for promotion and their team they're working on, the assignments they get. I think all those uh, things that can be super subtle can have a really big chilling effect on someone coming forward. Yeah, one of the members that we work with, uh, so we have kind of a, I have a unique position where I look inwards at a lot of different tech companies and how they're handling different things. And um, one of the, our members had a number of employees um, that requested time off during the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, because it was extremely triggering for a lot of people. And I think just like understanding that, you know, just in general, like the mental health days and things like that, like it's okay, you know, your your brain can need a rest too. It can be too much. Um, and I thought that was, they actually opened a Slack channel too for women to talk about it and had quite a few women um, that were engaging on there. So, um, okay. And then kind of a, a little bit of a tie to that. If you uh, have been um, harassed and, and you are a survivor and you took time off, what is a good way to kind of talk about that in an interview? You know, if you've, if you've taken a break in your career, what is a good way to weave that narrative so that you're not talking about um, the trauma and rather kind of talking about your story? I would defer to you. Do you have something? I was gonna, like yeah. an HR uh, well, I'm most... I'm used to people interviewing with us where like they tend to bring it up pretty early on um, and know that that will be an asset or <laughs> something that hurts them. Um, yeah, outside of that, I don't know. I'll defer you on that. Agree, and this is going to be a very perfect answer, but I, I think hopefully the person you're interviewing with has some sense of value for both your experience and also uh, the idea that adversity and you know, uh, your experience and emotional intelligence are some of the most important things you can look for in somebody um, having gone through. And, and hopefully they prize that. But I think I say that with like, that's a very Pollyanna thing to hope for folks to experience when they go through the interview process. And it depends on who they're talking to. All right, let's open up a question or two from the audience. Does anybody have a question? Zach's in the back with one of those funky little foam speaker boxes. And he's on the way. Have you guys all seen these before, by the way? Sorry? That's a, yeah, that is a tossable microphone. Is she, hello? Hello? Oh, oh I know. <laughs> we have solved this part of technology. Can you believe it? <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, my name is Sarah. Hi. <laughs> um, so I just realized that I funded Callisto three in 2015 in like a crowdsourcing thing when it was still really small. So I'm so amazed at where you guys are at now. Um, I really liked what you said about um, talking and educating younger people. Um, and I've experienced um, sexual assault when I was still a minor um, by someone like from my class. And I'm guessing, I'm like, Pretty sure that laws around that are a little bit more. Oh no, the technology is not there. <laughs> uh, 
Peter's on it. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering um, if you have any plans in the future to extend to um, like younger people taking action um, because like I think starting with college was like a really good idea because you know like a lot of news is coming around um, college campus assaults but um, I'm sure that like people who perpetrators in college like they don't just come to college and decide to do these things you know they probably did things in high school as well I'm sure that's a challenge but yeah I would like to hear um, your thoughts on that we definitely do have plans to expand to minors um, it'll probably take a few years because of the complexity around minor sexual assault and abuse and mandated reporter laws um, but I think that's also why it's so necessary because when you're young it doesn't feel like you have really anywhere to go that isn't a mandated reporter so you end up just sharing information with your other friends because you're afraid to talk to any adults um, so there being high quality information online that you can view anonymously as well as figuring out can you speak to somebody like an attorney and have that be safe uh, is really critical and I think when we think about say child sexual abuse that that's almost like when we hear about this it's so often serial offenders and figuring out how can we like Larry Nasser how can we find that a lot sooner um, and stop it sooner I think another thing is um, comprehensive sexual education um, absolutely should include consent in it uh, one thing that I learned uh, at my last workplace I was in the state of Florida the third largest state in America does not have mandated sexual education uh, it is voluntary as of 2011 they cut it out of the curriculum so that they could have more time for testing and currently in the state of Florida 10% of students receive any form of sexual education in any way you know so I think that you know the first thing we need to be doing is making sure that consent is even taught because we have we are failing our kids in a lot of places in this country right now all right one more uh, hi, and thanks for mentioning Larry Nasser. I've been listening to this Michigan Public Radio uh, podcast series called Believed, in which you start to understand that one of the problems was that all these different agencies, you know, the the uh, the detective in the little township, and then the Michigan State University Police, et cetera, none of them shared information, and so he went on forever because they all thought it was a one-off complaint. So can you talk a little bit about law enforcement implications and maybe a way that Callisto can support uh, sharing of information, which would be vital to really saving? I mean, it's, it's just shocking how many hundreds of girls were abused at, in the decade after which he was reported to police. Yeah, uh, it's a really big problem. And at some point, the FBI tried to create a database to help with this for police departments to share information with one another. But then it, it was such like a user experience nightmare that nobody used it. It was originally created for like serial killers. So um, it's like these long forms that didn't create a lot of value to you. And it wasn't really meant to work in environments where the survivor knows the perpetrator, which could be really a series of unique identifiers like in Callisto. So um, that's some of our hope is how can we help survivors find one another so that they can coordinate and even if they end up going to separate police departments make those police departments aware of one another um, one of the things that we're considering down the road is how do we then help also the backlog of cases come in and do we allow police to input cases or the fbi that we're a little nervous about because we tend to be very focused on survivor empowerment and survivor stories not going anywhere that they don't want it to. Um, but we're exploring different ideas for partnerships there. Like could the police reach back out to the survivor and let them know this is an option and send them an invite or something like that to allow them to, to put that data into the system. And then I wonder about legal ramifications. At what point is some of this encrypted or protected and all of that? Okay, we have time for one more question. And then all of our speakers, by the they will be here and, you know, we will break bread and continue drinking, of course, because it's a Tuesday, right? <laughs> Hi. So uh, in the past, I've worked for a company that uh, where I started at 100 employees and saw it grow to about 500 employees. And throughout, there was a culture that, or there, there, there was a sentiment, rather, that, that HR worked for the company and not for the individuals. And so that was one of many barriers to reporting sexual assault or many versions of. And so my question is, um, Peter, you mentioned several different channels of ways 
for employees at Airbnb to, to bring situations to light. And my specific question is, is if you were a company or if you're an employee at a company at this growth stage, what first program might you implement at your company that has uh, a good effect or, or a good impact for, for employees? Great question. Um, I think that every company struggles with that, with uh, either the perception or the reality of your HR uh, team working for the company or aligned with the leaders of a team instead of aligned with the folks who uh, you know, are the, the biggest part of that team, the, the lower level employees or your regular employees. Um, I think it's a very complex set of incentives that uh, drive that sort of either real or perceived alignment. Um, I think that, uh, and every, every company does it differently, that the practice I would, I think would be super important is to have someone who's in the company whose job it is to take and receive complaints and to investigate them in an unbiased way. And that person doesn't report to a business person in the company. They report, report either to the head of HR or to a senior HR leader. They're not accountable to the business. They sit outside the business. That's their role. That's their job. They're insulated. Everybody knows it. Um, and that way you don't have the really the structural incentives or the perception because honestly the perception itself can be the most chilling thing. People never speak. Um, so I would suggest that. Do you think that the term human resource, literally like making you into a resource, do you think that there's any anything around that language? I know that we've tried, we've moved towards people, you know, people operations, things like that. We say talent. Honestly, yeah. I you see talent that's yeah. not recruiting. Talent is everything. So, or it's like the talent partners and talent directors. And I just always um, hated yeah. the word like human resources. It makes you feel like a cog, you know? Yeah, I I feel like it keeps being rebranded, which like. Probably is is good, but I yeah. think that it keeps shuffling the problem down the road. Um, we'll just put a new name on it. Like, exactly, exactly. It Which I think like works very briefly, and then yeah, it yeah. doesn't work at all. Um, okay. The other thing that I've seen people do is ombuds, sort of a third party ombuds, which is somebody who's external to the company, but often paid for by the company, who uh, can help talk through with the employee their options, particularly around internal options. Like ombuds tend to be less good about say giving you like here's how you sue somebody, but they do tend to help you figure out at least like low level conflict at resolution and different techniques around that. Um, so, so some companies are using ombuds these days as a way a run around if people aren't, aren't uh, believing that HR has their best interests at heart. Interesting. It's like a, you know, when the police have like an internal um, investigator that comes in that's outside of the police unit. Yeah. Okay, well, that wraps up our speaking portion of the event. Um, thank you so much, Peter, and thank you, Jess, for speaking, and thank you again to Okta for hosting. I'll give you a round of applause. So the music's gonna go back on. We're gonna open back up over there. Please feel free to stay and chat. Um, enjoy, thank you.